It's a great privilege to be here at Southern. I'm very grateful for the invitation, uh, especially to give these Dean's lectures. Um, all I can say is that I'm, because I'm so flattered, I hope you're not completely disappointed by the end. If you're all sleeping peacefully by uh, the time I get to my conclusion, then I'll sneak out quietly and uh, we don't need to worry about the other lectures. The, the theme of these lectures is the wonderful subject of the pre-existence of Christ, that is, the Son of God's life in eternity with the Father before his incarnation. And this has for, a, for some time been a very controversial subject, both among systematic theologians and amongst biblical scholars. Uh, in the 70s, in the 1970s in particular in Britain, you may have heard of the myth of God incarnate controversy, which provoked a great storm. Uh, in recent years, uh, among systematic theologians like uh, Karl Josef Kuschel in Germany, a, Catholic, a liberal Catholic scholar, has written a large book uh, overturning the old idea of pre-existence. And similarly, the very influential uh, American theologian Robert Jensen has recently written uh, a critique of the traditional conception of pre-existence. So uh, on the theological side, it's very controversial. Similarly, among biblical scholars, New Testament scholars often argue that the concept of Christ's pre-existence is one which is very late in the New Testament, only emerged towards the end of the first century, uh, towards the end of the New Testament period, and is in any case quite marginal in the New Testament, not attested very widely in it, and so of only marginal significance. It's this kind of discussion that provoked me to write my current book on pre-existence, and the aim of it is to argue that pre the pre-existence of Christ comes not only in Paul's letters, not only in John's Gospel, not only in Hebrews, but also in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's Gospel. And that's the controversial element of the book, uh, to show that the pre-existence of Christ, in particular, can be seen in the I have come sayings of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's Gospel, in those first three Gospels. So, Part one, what I want to talk about first is the current and dominant scholarly paradigm that I'm kind of arguing against. I mentioned that uh, New Testament scholars regard the pre-existence of Christ as a marginal phenomenon in the New Testament and a late historical development in New Testament times. <clears throat> and that's essentially based on a certain understanding of the development of of the person of Christ in that first century, on the development of earliest Christology. So in the beginnings of the story of Christianity, the narrative goes something like this. In either a few years BC or a few years AD, Jesus of Nazareth was, was born, and he joined a reform movement within Ju Judaism that was headed by someone called John, famous for his baptizing, to whom Jesus, this Jesus was probably related. Eventually, in the course of the development of this movement, Jesus actually emerged as the leader, as greater than John, and was seen by himself and by his disciples as a prophet, perhaps even the great eschatological prophet of the end times. He proclaimed the kingdom of God, chose disciples who were to form the nucleus of uh, restored Israel, and uh, nevertheless, his popularity meant that he, the movement had to be forcibly suppressed, both because of and uh, despite this popularity. The, the suppression of the movement led to the execution of this Jesus, uh, and uh, staggeringly, though, certain members of the Jesus movement claimed after his death to have seen visions of him. This, in conjunction with certain complications around the situation with the tomb, led them to proclaim him as resurrected and as Messiah, um, uh, a move that had not been taken before his death, but which was the product of these resurrection appearances. In due course, uh, further on in the, uh, in, in the succeeding decades, he was viewed as a semi-divine figure, as someone who even inhabited the, uh, Christian, meeting, uh, the Christian meetings. He was sensed as, as present in these early Christian uh, worship sessions and uh, then was proclaimed as a semi-divine Lord figure. A few de decades later on still, particularly in the community of another certain John, John the Evangelist, he was regarded not only as a uh, prophet, not only as Messiah, not only as a semi-divine Lord figure, but as the incarnation of God himself, having been in the beginning with the Father and now incarnate as the Son. 
So, John's Gospel represents the full flowering of Christian, uh, Christological development in New Testament times. It comes right at the end of the process. By contrast, according to this scholarly paradigm, the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke's Gospels, called the synoptic Gospels because they, uh, there are a lot of parallels between them, these Gospels kind of cut, um, give you a snapshot of this development as it's midway through. It uh, gives you a picture of Jesus when he's reached the stage of having been regarded as Messiah, but before you get to the stage of him being God incarnate. Now, this is a little bit of an artificial summary, but it nevertheless captures the main picture of the uh, current scholarly paradigm. A lot of scholars would uh, say that it's a bit more messy than that, um, particularly with Paul, but for the sake of time, I've given you this brief schematic summary. Let me give you three reasons initially why I'm suspicious of this paradigm. So uh, if if you're following on the handout, you've had the paradigm, now you're having the problems. First then, a point which I'll just make very briefly, that much scholarship has seriously underestimated the historical reliability of John's Gospel. The majority of scholars, as I've implied in the uh, outline of the scholarly paradigm, regard sayings of pre-existence and of uh, Jesus referring to himself in divine terms in John's Gospels as a serious anachronism. In other words, when John is writing his Gospel, his own portrait of Jesus, in fact, reflects more of his own thought than of the thought of the historical Jesus. So he's essentially reading back this later developed Christology into the period of Jesus' own lifetime. But I think that a number of uh, scholars, conservative scholars in particular have provided compelling reasons for some suspicion of the scholarly paradigm at this point. And I refer you in particular to Craig Blomberg's book, The Historical Reliability of John's Gospel, published in 2001. Uh, a, uh, an excellent statement, uh, in particular on the authorship of John's Gospel. He shows how on internal grounds, on the grounds of the evidence from the Gospel itself, and on the grounds of the early witness of the church fathers, uh, there are very good reasons for seeing John the disciple, uh, the original disciple of Jesus, as the author of the gospel. But I'm not going to go into detail at this point on the question of the historical reliability of John, merely to state the point. Second problem, I think that Paul's letters seriously scupper the evolutionary or developmental model of Christology that I outlined above. Paul's letters are, of course, among the earliest documents of the New Testament, and at the same time as being among the earliest, they also give evidence for some of the highest Christology, some of the most exalted pictures of Jesus uh, in the New Testament. And so you can see pre-existence all over the place in those letters of Paul. First of all, active personal pre-existence. I'll uh, explain what I mean by those terms, active personal pre pre-existence as we go through. Starting off with Philippians 2, Philippians 2 is one place where a number of scholars find it particularly difficult to avoid the obvious implications of pre-existence. To quote verses 6 to 8 here, which I've printed on your handouts, this is Jesus Christ, who being in the form of God, did not reckon equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, coming in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So there are two key elements for my sort of discussion of pre-existence in this statement. First is the dramatic movement in the transition that we see in this, uh, according to some people, a hymn, or a poem. The development, the dramatic movement from Jesus being in the form of God on the one hand to taking the form of a servant. Now, people often, if, you, if you've done any exegesis classes on Philippians or, or read any commentaries on Philippians, you'll know that there's a lot of debate about what, G, what, what Paul means by Jesus being in the form of God. But the majority view, even now, is that when Paul talks about Jesus being in the form of God, it means form in the sense of the form that reveals reality. It's not form as opposed to reality. Jesus really is 
in the person of God just as he really does become a servant. So this dramatic movement from Christ Jesus being in the form of God to taking on the form of a servant gives you a sort of before and after. Not that he ceases to become God in the incarnation, but there is definitely an implication of pre-existence, of a prior existence in the form of God. Secondly, enclosed within this dramatic movement from being in the form of God to taking on as well the form of a servant is how this takes place. And here, the key statement is that he emptied himself. He emptied himself, making himself nothing. The crucial element here is the description of Jesus' action as a voluntary act. As you can see from the verb, he emptied himself. It's not the father emptying him, but he himself doing this as his own action. So he's not merely the passive envoy of the father. It's not merely someone who's been sent by the father against his own will, but he is one who himself undertakes to take on human flesh in the incarnation. Now, some scholars have raised questions about whether you can really see pre-existence in Philippians 2 here. Uh, According to one scholar, Jerome Murphy O'Connor, he writes, a surprise awaits anyone who dispassionately looks at the evidence. Always be suspicious when people say, you know, uh, the key to this is looking at the evidence dispassionately and objectively. I mean, who'd want to read the Bible dispassionately anyway? (laughs) Um, And similarly, James Dunn questions whether you can uh, really see pre-existence in this. Neither of them, though, I think, take seriously this dramatic movement from being in the form of God to Jesus emptying himself to taking on human flesh. As uh, as Tom Wright, in his much better account of Philippians 2 here, has said, no mere personification, but a person, a conscious individual entity, is envisaged. The pre-existent son regarded equality with God not as excusing him from the task of suffering and death, but actually as uniquely qualifying him for that vocation. So we have in Philippians 2 active personal pre-existence. Active in the sense that Jesus is in the form of God and then acts to become incarnate and personal because it's not that he's a a sort of mysterious uh, cosmic principle who becomes incarnate in Jesus, but he is a mysterious eternal person who becomes incarnate in Christ Jesus. The second passage that I'd just like to mention in this respect is from 2 Corinthians 8. Uh, All the passages that I'm going to refer to, I hope, are on on the handout. Uh, The second one under this heading of active personal pre-existence. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Though he was rich, he became poor so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Again, a clear indication of pre-existence here because of the implication of a prior state of the pre-incarnate son, the eternal son, being rich. In other words, as is probably uh, paralleled in John 17, uh, John 17 you have the reference to the son talking about the glory that I had with you, Father, before the world began. Probably a similar idea here in 2 Corinthians 8 that uh, Christ is in possession of the riches of the glory of glorious fellowship with the Father in eternity, uh, but gives up that uh, eternal fellowship in heaven to take on human flesh and die. Uh, here, the becoming poor is probably not just a reference to the incarnation, but a reference to death as well. Here, as often in, uh, in the statements where Paul is talking about the salvation that Christ brings, he sort of brings the incarnation and the cross very closely together in the same, in the same saying uh, as in Philippians 2 as well. You can see that both Philippians 2 and 2 Corinthians 8 are good examples of this. The pre-incarnate Christ coming to be incarnate and to die. Secondly, on Paul, Christ is represented not only as a saviour who has come from eternal existence with the Father, but actually as a co-creator with with the Father in eternity. Now, one of the most uh, striking passages in this respect is 1 Corinthians 8, chapter 6, 
And here, Paul gives a certain interpretation of what was known as the Shema, uh, an interpretation which would have been shocking to his Jewish contemporaries. Now, the Shema was the daily, uh, daily confession recited by Jews coming from Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. One of the classic statements about uh, divine unity, about God being one person. Now, if you bear in mind that statement, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, then looking at 1 Corinthians 8.6 gives you an interesting uh, spin on that original Deuteronomy saying, where Paul refers to one God, the Father, from whom all things come, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things come, and through whom we live. So the one God who is the one Lord in Deuteronomy 6 is sort of, people use the technical term bifurcated, almost sort of split up. Again, it's a sort of, uh, it's an imprecise word. But the, the one God, the one Lord of the Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament as the Father and the Lord who is the Son, both of whom are actively, were actively involved in creation. This, of course, is an idea that is shared uh, not only elsewhere in Paul, but also by John's Gospel, the Epistle to the Hebrews, uh, and uh, elsewhere in the New Testament. So it's striking that Paul doesn't identify Jesus purely as uh, a saviour who comes in the end, but as the creator who was there in the beginning. And a parallel to this can be seen in Colossians 1 as well, uh, in the statement, because in him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, things seen and unseen, whether thrones or dominions, whether principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. So the phenomenal scope is, is, uh, is, is, is what Paul is trying to get across in Colossians 1 here. Everything, things seen, unseen, principalities and powers, all things in heaven and on earth, all these were created, not only by the Father, but also through the agency of the eternal Son. So, as with 1 Corinthians 8 here, we have very strong evidence for the pre-existence of Christ. Thirdly and finally on Paul, Christ and Israel, where I start off by mentioning the much-discussed reference and very mysterious reference in 1 Corinthians 10 uh, to the rock that was with, with, uh, <laughs> that was with Israel in the wilderness being Christ. What Paul is saying here is that when Moses struck the rock and provided uh, water for Israel in the, in the wilderness, in the book of Numbers, it was in fact not merely an impersonal rock who was providing the water, but Christ himself who was providing sustenance for the nation of Israel in that particular situation. And Paul's argument doesn't really work if it's not Christ who's providing the water and I'm, I'm not going to go into detail in the, into the argument of 1 Corinthians 10 as a whole here but uh, in 1 Corinthians 10 Paul is arguing that just as the Israelites had Christ with them in the wilderness so also the, the, the Corinthians who Paul is writing to should watch out because having Christ with them didn't save the uh, Israelites, didn't prevent them from being overthrown so the Corinthians as well should watch out and watch their lives so that they're not destroyed like the Israelites were. The Corinthians shouldn't fall into the same trap, and so Paul says it then in verse 9, that we should not test Christ as some of them did. We should not test Christ as some of those Israelites did. Not that the Israelites were uh, simply testing God the Father, who was Yahweh in, in, uh, in the Old Testament. The Israelites were testing the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Eternal Father, eternal Son. So, the divine Christ really was a part of Israel's history. So, that's Paul's letters being full of pre existence, even in this early stage uh, of New Testament history, of earliest Christian history. Thirdly, How's everyone doing? Everyone still, still with me? Good. Thirdly, 
There are strong indications in Matthew, Mark and Luke in these synoptic Gospels that Jesus is portrayed in these Gospels as a heavenly figure. Jesus is portrayed here as a heavenly figure. Perhaps the most useful evidence to prepare the way for my overall argument about pre-existence, the pre-existence of Christ in Matthew, Mark and Luke, is to show, to point out the material in these synoptic Gospels where Jesus transcends the heaven-earth divide. So I would argue, I'm arguing here, that already before Easter, even before his resurrection in his pre-risen person, Jesus is depicted as having a heavenly identity. To put it another way, he's not merely firmly planted on earth in the course of his ministry, but he's actively uh, and personally involved in the heavenly realms at the same time. First of all, the evidence from the transfiguration, which uh, I've printed out selected bits of in, uh, on the handout. The importance of the transfiguration of the transfiguration for the argument here lies in precisely this point that it gives evidence for Jesus' transcendence of his earthly existence. In other words, that Jesus goes beyond uh, merely the person that you would, would have seen if you'd walked past him on a Galilee hillside or wherever. He's also envisaged simultaneously as a heavenly figure. And uh, the bits of evidence that I'll bring in here are the high mountain, the white clothes, the heavenly company of Elijah and Moses, and God's calling him son here. So, uh, reading out the extracts on your handout. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, transformed before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to him Elijah with Moses, to them, sorry, Jesus and the disciples, Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, this is my beloved son, listen to him. So first of all, the, the scene is set with Jesus and the disciples being on a high mountain. Now in the Old Testament and in early Judaism, high mountains are obviously are, are, um, are kind of halfway points between heaven and earth, where revelation often takes place. As one commentator has put it, it's a kind of suburb of heaven. Uh, or if you're from the sort of rock generation, a stairway to heaven. Um, <laughs> Not actually heaven itself, but almost. In the next verse, the uh, transformation of Jesus' clothes uh, is shown. They reflect, when he's transformed by God, a kind of heavenly whiteness, uh, whiter than any other uh, earthly bleacher could manage. Now, Richard Borkham, in uh, a number of studies on, on heaven and uh, hell, has pointed in, in, uh, in Jewish and Christian tradition, has pointed out that shining garments are often, uh, well, in fact, invariably, evidence not necessarily of a divine person, but certainly of a heavenly or angelic figure. In discussing the motif in Jewish literature, he writes, and I, I quote here, a standard, talks of a standard set of descriptives that could be used to describe any heavenly being, including quite ordinary as well as quite exalted heavenly beings. The basic idea behind these descriptions is that heaven and its inhabitants are shining and bright. Hence the descriptions employ a stock series of images of brightness. Heavenly beings or their dress, make the dress there, are typically shining like the sun or the stars, gleaming like bronze or precious stones, fiery bright like torches, or maybe this is the key bit for our purposes, or light, lightning, dazzling white like snow or pure wool. He's not talking about the transfiguration there particularly, but on the general uh, area of the Old Testament and early Judaism more widely. And if you uh, look on in, later on in Mark's Gospel, you can see that one of the angelic figures who's involved in the resurrection scene, a young man he's depicted as, uh, a young angelic figure, is described as, having a, as being a young man in a white robe. Furthermore, in Matthew's 
and Luke's slightly expanded accounts of the transfiguration, it's explicit that not only Jesus' clothes, but also his face is shining bright and white. In Matthew, it shines like the sun, and in Luke, Jesus' appearance is altered, his whole appearance as he is praying. Uh, Again, the heavenly character of Jesus in this transfiguration incident is is supported further by his heavenly company. He is met by Elijah and Moses, who obviously come from the heavenly realms to speak with him. Uh, As uh, Pesch, Rudolf Pesch, one of the uh, main German commentators on Mark's gospel, has written, the fact that Elijah and Moses speak with Jesus indicates that Jesus belongs to their world. Where Pesch and another number of other commentators go wrong, though, I would argue, is on seeing this transfiguration episode, this episode where Jesus is transformed into heavenly brightness. Where they go wrong is to see this as merely an anticipation of what he's going to be like at the second coming. We know from the Gospels the picture of Jesus coming with all his angels uh, and with fiery uh, brightness at the the parousia. We know that picture. And so a number of scholars argue that what's happening at the Transfiguration is that that picture is you're being given a kind of sneak preview of what Jesus is going to be like at the parousia. Where this view falls down, though, I think, is in the fact that the heavenly identity of Jesus that's revealed in this episode is his identity as the Son of God. So it's not only as this uh, future coming figure that he appears in a kind of snapshot uh, preview form, but this is his true identity as Son. And we know from the Gospels that there's no time in his ministry or in in his eternal existence, there's no time at which Jesus has not been the Son. He doesn't become the Son at the baptism, He doesn't become the son at the resurrection and he doesn't become the son at the parousia at the second coming. So it seems that Jesus' shining heavenly identity shown forth here in this transfiguration is not merely an anticipation of the resurrection or of the second coming but is his already present reality that has been hitherto merely veiled. Secondly, this idea of Jesus as a heavenly being is supported by the reference in Mark 13, 32, which again is on your handout. This, again, mysterious saying, about that day, he's talking about the parousia, the second coming, about the day of that second coming and the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, only the Father. So there's a hierarchy implied of heavenly beings here. Father, at the top, then the sun, and then the angels. That's the order, well, in in, in reverse, that's the order order that you see in the verse. You would expect that the angels, being members of, of the divine court, being members of the heavenly council, you would expect, perhaps, that they might have access to heavenly secrets like this. Similarly, the implication is with the sun, as, again, a heavenly being. Uh, You would expect him to have knowledge of this. But despite the fact that angels and sun are members of God's heavenly court, they don't, even they don't have access to this heavenly secret. This motif of the divine council, which is very well known by Old Testament scholars, but New Testament scholars don't tend to talk about it much, this, this idea of, of God being in the heavenly court, that you see, it, I guess, especially in passages like the beginning of Job, Uh, where the angels and and Satan gather before God in heaven. This this motif is uh, very common in the Old Testament, and so uh, lots of passages, I think, in the Gospels make better sense when you bear this image in mind. I suppose the big question here is whether Jesus is a temporary member of this council or whether he's a permanent member. For example, a prophet in the Old Testament got his prophetic commission, got his prophetic message that he was to deliver to Israel, got it by being brought into the heavenly council, being brought into God's confidence, if you like, and given this commission to take to Israel. But the prophet was only a temporary member of this council. For For a split second, he became a heavenly being. On the other hand, 
my argument here is that Jesus is a permanent member of this heaven. It's, it's a bit like with the UN. The question is, you know, are they permanent members of the UN Security Council or, or are they uh, merely um, part-timers? Um, so in Luke 10.18, Jesus sees a vision of Satan falling like lightning from heaven. And in Luke 19, uh, in, he uh, sees that uh, he somehow knows this information that nothing will harm the disciples. No harm will, is going to come to his disciples. I've just uh, seen in my manuscript that um, I, I've got reference to special knowledge which Jesus has in the periscope. Um, the uh, word pericope often gets uh, changed by spell checkers to periscope. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if there's any special significance to that. But uh, in these references in verse 18 to Jesus seeing this vision, which I argue is a vision that Jesus sees in his lifetime, not in a pre-existent state, uh, and in this knowledge that nothing is going to harm the disciples in these first two verses, uh, this is actually all quite in keeping with what a prophet might see or know. But in verse 20, and I put verse t- Luke 10, 20 here, we see that Jesus' knowledge also extends to the fact that the disciples' names are written in heaven. And here, the portrait of Jesus goes way beyond what one would expect of an Old Testament prophet, beyond even what one would expect of an eschatological prophet. Here, it's closer to that which is known about from uh, exalted angelic figures or people like Enoch in Jewish literature, Uh, these exalted heavenly secrets connected with election. Again, the exalted heavenly mysteries of election can be seen in Luke 10, 21. uh, In this very famous passage that I put on your handout, also in Matthew 11, where Jesus says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your decree, your eudokia. So here, Jesus shows that he has insight into the mystery of the heavenly decree, into the mystery of heavenly and divine election. And as the passage uh, goes on, I haven't put this on the handout, but the passage goes on to talk about not only Jesus having uh, intimate knowledge of God's election, but he even participates in divine election. No one knows the Son except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. The Son is also involved in the choosing in election. Again, uh, I've mentioned the passage. This is over, we're going over the page now. The passage in which Jesus is portrayed as a heavenly intercessor. He not only has knowledge of the attempt of Satan to overcome Simon, 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 behold, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you so that your faith might not fail. He knows what's going on in the heavenly realms and he also overcomes Satan in the heavenly realms uh, through his in heavenly intercession. I'd argue that this isn't just normal praying that's going on. We can talk about this afterwards if you like. This isn't just uh, normal praying. But uh, a German scholar has argued uh, that he's being portrayed as a kind of heavenly opponent of Satan. It's a very interesting article. This, the first half of it's talking about, um, talks a lot about sort of Palestinian sieving techniques and what it means for Satan to sift uh, Peter like wheat. Um, but the rest of the article is very interesting theologically. Anyway, um, moving on. The, to summarise, the implications then are twofold. In this heavenly council material, you can see Jesus participating in this heavenly council that we know about, from example, as in Job chapter 1, uh, and that he's not merely in possession of information about what's going on, but he actively participates in that divine court. Uh, very briefly and finally, Jesus heavenly identity can be seen in the fact that he is recognised only fully in the course of his ministry by other heavenly figures and by other spiritual beings. So in the first two examples this is by demons who see his identity as the Holy One of God in Mark 1 
and the Son of God in Mark 3. Uh, what, have, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And the unclean spirits cry out, saying, you are the Son of God in chapter 3. Because these statements, these statements aren't just references to uh, passing incidents in, when, in, in which Jesus is depicted as a heavenly, uh, involved in some kind of heavenly activity, but it's actually showing that his identity is a heavenly one, which can only be perceived in its fullness by heavenly figures. Again, the ultimate heavenly figure is, of course, God himself. And uh, as we've seen in the transfiguration already, God identifies Jesus truly uh, in, his, in who he really is as the Son. And similarly, in the baptism here in Mark 1.11, a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved Son, in you, in you I am well pleased. So Jesus' true relation to the Father is only seen fully in the course of his ministry by other, fem- uh, by other heavenly figures, whether good or evil. So this is all very well, but do we see in these statements actual evidence for the pre-existence of Christ in Matthew, Mark and Luke? Well, I don't think we quite do, although we almost do. Hence, this is where I'm finally going to get on to the I have come sayings, which are going to be the focus in the next two lectures as well. So, you know some of the I have come sayings, uh, and I've printed them on the sheet. I'm also going to incorporate discussion of the Son of Man has come sayings. There are a mixture of, of, of these two kinds of sayings in, the, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Sometimes Jesus says, I have come in order to do such and such. Some, some of the time he says, the Son of Man has come in order to do such and such. And in addition to these, I'm going to add in for good measure two statements where demons refer to Jesus coming in order to do such and such. So this gives us a total of ten sayings that I'm going to focus on in this uh, course of lectures. Uh, So just to skim through these ten on your handouts, the first two then are questions by the demons. The demon says, what have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Again, very similarly in the second one in uh, in a, con- in a different context in Matthew's Gospel, have you come here to destroy us? Then numbers 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8 are all statements where Jesus says, I have come in order to do something. So number, f- uh, number 3, for this reason, for the purpose of preaching, I have come forth. Number 4, I have not come to call the, right- uh, the righteous, but sinners Number five, do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Number six, I have come to cast fire onto the earth. Seven, do not think that I have come to bring peace on the earth. No, I have not come to bring peace, but division or a sword. And then finally, among the I have come sayings, I have come to divide man against father and daughter against mother and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law and so on. And then finally, in num- uh, the, the last two examples, the Son of Man has come to, in the last case, seek and save what was lost. And then in Mark 10:45, uh, so back to number nine, even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, the key element which all of these have in common, which I want to go, go into and explore a bit, is that they talk of Jesus coming with a purpose. I have come in order to do such and such. So I think there's a prima facie case, there's, an, there's, a, there's a case uh, initially for uh, even on a literal and obvious level, these sayings referring to Jesus coming from heaven. Coming with a purpose implies that this coming is a deliberate act. Again, there's a parallel here perhaps with the uh, passage that we looked at in Philippians 2. There's a deliberate act on the part of Jesus who was in the form of God, nevertheless made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant. I think that similar pattern you can see in these sayings here as well. The coming is a deliberate act and therefore it implies a before and after. It implies a place of origin from which the person has come. Now, in Jesus' case, of course, when he's talking about uh, 
his coming. When Jesus says, I have come to seek and to save the lost, when he says, I've come to cast fire on the earth, he's not merely referring to uh, the individual incident that he's say he's, you know, I was in Capernaum yesterday, but now I'm in, uh, in, the De- in, in somewhere else, in the Decapolis, and so here I've come to cast fire. No, he's not talking about specific journeys that he's taking around uh, Palestine. The, rather, he's referring to the totality of his earthly ministry in these I have come sayings. The implication, the strong implication is then that he's come from somewhere else, outside of the earthly sphere, in other words, from heaven. Now, that's not 100% uh, open and shut so that we can finish the lecture series now, but it is at least up for discussion and what I'm going to propose to test over the course of the next two lectures. In favour of this, just uh, in closing, in in favour of this sort of literal reading of the I have come sayings is the fact that, in my view, the other explanations given by scholars for these sayings are very unconvincing. So, for example, the majority of scholars view... Uh, these I have come sayings of Jesus as evidence for his kind of prophetic mindset. So uh, this is evidence for Jesus being, again, the, the, the eschatological prophet, perhaps, that was expected in early Judaism. But the problem with this hypothesis is there's actually no evidence for any prophet in the Old Testament or in early Judaism summing up their life's work by saying, I have come in order to do such and such, which I would regard as a ser- serious law in the hypothesis the one text which is brought in every now and again in support of this discussion is a statement made by Josephus who of course wasn't a prophet but who in one saying at least scholars argue is kind of portraying himself in semi-prophetic ways he's claiming to in some sense tell the future even though he's not a prophet proper Josephus is captured by the Romans uh, after the failure of his uh, particular episodes in the Jewish war in, uh, between 66 and 73 AD. Uh, it's captured by Vespasian. Uh, but Vespasian is a bit surprised when suddenly this general who he's taken captive says the following. And uh, I've got this on your handout. Josephus says, you imagine Vespasian. He's talking to the Roman emperor, emperor of all things. You, you imagine Vespasian that in the person of Josephus, You've taken a mere captive, but I have come to you as a messenger of greater things. But again, the parallel with the I have come sayings of Jesus breaks down here because Josephus is merely referring to an individual incident in his life. He's merely referring to the fact that he has come from Judea as a captive to Rome, uh, marking an individual uh, and rather unfortunate episode in his life. Jesus coming, on the other hand, as I've mentioned already, refers to the totality of his earthly ministry. Now, this is the point that uh, I'm going to develop in the next two lectures. The second lecture will attempt to put uh, a proper Old Testament and Jewish background in place against which to read these I have come sayings of Jesus and in the final lecture we're going to look in more detail at the I have come sayings of Jesus themselves and in the course of this discussion I hope it becomes that the pre-existence of Christ far from being an unimportant aspect of the witness of the Gospels is in fact integral to the way that Matthew, Mark and Luke characterise Jesus. Thanks very much. Great. I talked this morning a bit about the various parallels that scholars have brought, uh, brought into the interpretation of the sayings in the Synoptic Gospels about Jesus' coming. Jesus says, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I have come in order to do such and such on many and various occasions. And one of the key parallels I mentioned that scholars bring in is one from Josephus, where Josephus also says uh, to the Roman emperor, I have come in order to be a messenger to you of great destinies. Now, I explained why I think that that's not a very good parallel to the I have come sayings of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's Gospels. And so this lecture is going to be focused on the 
proper Old Testament and Jewish backgrounds to the I have come sayings of Jesus. It's critical, of course, to whenever we're looking at the New Testament texts to get exactly right what the proper Jewish Old Testament context of that is because obviously if we're looking at a, at a particular theme in, in the Gospels or elsewhere in the New Testament, if we put it up against one aspect of the Old Testament uh, and then put it up against a different aspect of the Old Testament, then we might well come up with a different view of what the, the passage is about. So we can't just choose any old uh, passage from the Old Testament which happens to have the same word wording that our New Testament passage has. It's key to sort of evaluate critically uh, which is the appropriate Old Testament and Jewish background, and then to distinguish which is inappropriate background to bring in. Just to recap on the previous lecture, I outlined, if you remember, if you were here, the common scholarly paradigm in which Jesus is gradually, in the course of the first century, in the course of the New Testament period, gradually uh, understood as first prophet, then Messiah, then a semi-divine Lord figure, and finally God incarnate. And I gave three reasons why I was suspicious of this early Christian history as put forward by many scholars. And this present lecture aims to supply a third, a third reason for my, uh, well, fourth reason, I suppose, for my suspicion. And in fact, this lecture and the final lecture tomorrow over lunch will, I hope, not only cast suspicion on this paradigm, but actually contradict it. I noticed, I noticed again in the previous lecture that the I have come saying, I have come plus purpose, purpose formula, the idea of saying I have come in order to cast fire on the earth and such like, this was not a way of speaking whereby normal people wandering around on, on the Galilean mountainsides would sum up their lives' work. Not even a Messiah or, a, or a, a prophet figure in the Old Testament, not even a prophetic figure in the Old Testament would sum up his ministry by saying, I have come to proclaim whatever it is, God's, God's message. Uh, rather, I'm saying that this is a distinctive formula that has a, proper, a distinctive Old Testament background, not prophetic, not messianic, but as follows. I'm going to argue today that the I have come plus purpose formula and uh, these various um, summary statements are on your handout. I'm going to argue that the I have come plus for purpose formula in the Gospels is most closely and most abundantly paralleled in the announcements by angels of their comings from heaven. So, again, the attempt is to provide a firmer background for the I have come sayings of Jesus than scholars have previously managed to offer. Critically then, angels do sum up the totality of an earthly visit that they're paying to the human sphere by this phrase, I have come plus a purpose. And they can do this because they have come from a pre-existence in heaven. Angels have a prior existence in heaven before they come to visit whoever it is, Daniel or, or whoever uh, in, the, in the Old Testament. So this isn't something that can be said uh, by an ordinary human person to sum up their life's work, but it is said by a heavenly figure. So in this lecture, I'm going to look at a number of these examples. Um, as, I, as I said, a, a number of these examples may well be uh, very obscure, seem, very from, seem like they're from very obscure texts. Well, I hope that's uh, all to the good because uh, I hope that it's a, a sort of learning experience getting to know some of these uh, new and strange Jewish texts. Uh, for the first six examples, I'm just going to go through the examples that are on your handout. The first six are from a book that I hope you are familiar with, uh, the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. And uh, this first, these first two examples come in Daniel 9. And as you may know, in Daniel 9, uh, Daniel recalls the prophecy of Jeremiah that God is going to restore the nation of Israel after a certain period of time. And so Daniel prays to God in accordance with this, this uh, prophecy that God would act on it. And Daniel reports that at exactly the time that he started praying, Gabriel visited him at the time of the evening sacrifice. And so the angel then declares in Daniel 9, to 23, if you uh, want to follow on your handouts, 
Uh, and he instructed me, this is Daniel speaking, Daniel, uh, he instructed me and conversed with me, Gabriel did, and said, Daniel, I have come forth now to give you understanding. As soon as you began to pray, a message went forth, and I have come to announce to you that you are a man highly favoured. So a message, uh, a revelation from God is issued in the heavenly court and God commissions Gabriel to go and take this message to Daniel. So in, in quick succession, we have two examples of the angel Gabriel saying, I have come in order to, in this case, reveal uh, something to Daniel. The next four examples are from Daniel 10 and the beginning of Daniel 11. Here, Daniel sees a vision of a man who is nevertheless obviously an angelic figure. Sometimes uh, angelic figures are seen as, uh, are are described as a man, but you you know from their, in this case, you know from their shining uh, appearance, their shining clothes, and from the fact that Daniel is seeing this in a vision, that it's not simply a human being, but an angelic figure. Uh, This man tells Daniel, again, that he's highly favoured, and tells Daniel to stand up and listen because I have now been sent to you, he says in uh, verse 11 of Daniel 10. And uh, this is a common feature that when angels say, I have come, they often talk in the same same context of having been sent because obviously having been sent by God from the heavenly sphere and coming to humanity in the uh, human sphere are sort of two sides of the same coin, being sent by God and coming so uh, this uh, man in inverted commas says and he said uh, well Daniel reporting the visit the the, uh, figure says do not fear Daniel because from the first day on which you gave your heart to understand and to be humbled your words were heard before God and I have come on account of your words now here we don't have um, a a strict purpose clause I have come in order to But the angel does say, I have come because of your words. And the clear implication is that he's coming to answer Daniel's prayers. Um, That's the obvious point that the angel is making. But he does talk about a second purpose as well. Uh, In verse 14, I have come to reveal to you what will happen to your people at the end of days because your vision is for those days. Then another angel comes to Daniel later on in the chapter and says to him, do you know why I have come to you? Again, the implication of purpose, although uh, not a purpose clause, the why implies that the angel is talking about coming with a purpose. It doesn't state the purpose, of course, because that's precisely why he's asking Daniel why, uh, if he he knows why. But uh, he is making a statement about his purpose. And the angel answers his own question in uh, this final reference from Daniel in chapter 11, verse 2, saying, In the the first year of Cyrus the king, he, that's the Lord, told me to strengthen him and give him courage. And now the angel says, But now I have come to reveal the truth to you. So this language is very similar to the rest of the language in Daniel, and a special focus on angels saying, I have come in order to reveal truth something particular that they've been commissioned to reveal by God from the heavenly council to come into the human realm to speak. The angel then is summarising the reason in this I have come plus purpose, summarising the reason for his visit to the human sphere. Next we delve into some of the uh, more arcane Jewish texts from the period. Um, Perhaps not many of you in this room, perhaps not any, have heard of the Sode Raza, the secrets of the angel Raziel, uh, because this is uh, a text connected with the angel Raziel, who's a, a rabbinic angel. And this is a little known Hebrew text, probably from the early rabbinic period. Uh, some scholars date it to around uh, 1st century BC, 1st century AD. Uh, and some connect it not with the rabbis, but with earlier groups, groups with. Uh, who are sort of connected and similar to those of the Dead Sea Scrolls. This work is probably part of a sequel to One Enoch, if if you've heard of that text. The work begins with a prayer of Adam, uh, and after Adam's prayer, the angel Raziel 
comes and addresses him. And he says to Adam, I have come to make known to you pure words and great wisdom and in order to make you wise by the words of this holy book. So Raziel gives the explanation for his coming in these terms, to make known something to Adam and to make him wise. He's actually giving Adam a holy book, as it's mentioned here. And this is, uh, as is common in, in Jewish apocalyptic literature, often the heavenly secrets are passed on in the form of a book. This book is then given uh, by Adam to Enoch, uh, who learns all about the uh, courses of the heavenly stars from it and about the names of the various angels. And uh, then Noah is the next person to uh, pick up this book in the succession of, uh, of this text as it's passed on. And it's how Noah learns how to build the ark. So, pretty important book. Number eight, the Apocalypse of Moses. This is a text that's probably more secure, that we can say pretty definitely was written in the first century AD or the second century AD around that time. Uh, And it's a revelation to Moses of some of the events which took place at the beginning of creation and then later on. Often we associate an apocalypse with things that are talked about happening at the end of time. Uh, This is a book which tells you what happens at the beginning of time. And it's probably a sort of explanation by early Jews to when they were sort of reflecting on the fact of how on earth does Moses know what happened in the Garden of Eden? Sort of stands to reason. If you think that Moses wrote the Pentateuch, then you you might wonder how on earth did uh, did he know what went on in the Garden of Eden? Well, the the answer that um, one early Jew came up with was, well, Moses must have had a a divine revelation uh, about these events, and that's what's reported in this book, The Apocalypse of Moses. Now, when he gets on to talking about the fall, and uh, especially Eve's role in the fall, Eve describes to her descendants uh, how this fall came about and she recounts that the devil calls the serpent they're not completely the exact uh, same person but the serpent is a sort of help helper of of the devil according to uh, this apocalypse and the devil says I have come to observe you having discovered that you were greater than all the animals so this in this case it's not an angel but the devil who comes into the human sphere, into the Garden of Eden, to observe the serpent and to uh, get him to carry out his purposes. So the devil journeys to earth, and the serpent is initially reluctant, but the devil talks him into tempting Eve. The next two examples come from the fourth book of Ezra, so-called. We actually mentioned it, actually mentioned it in the, this morning in the discussion of uh, the Messiah figures in early Jewish texts. This one was the one which has a pre-existent Messiah like, uh, like the, the four Gospels. And it uh, dates from the end of the first century uh, AD and we know this pretty definitely because it talks about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD having recently happened and it's a Jewish reflection on how on earth God can do this to Israel. How can God punish Israel with the destruction of her her central uh, institution, the temple, when Israel is more righteous than the other nations? And it's these precisely these other unrighteous nations that have wrought havoc on Israel. So there's a great degree of scholarly consensus that uh, for Ezra dates to the end of the first century. Um, at the end of the, it's divided up into various visions uh, that Ezra has, uh, in which he's visited by angels. And this second visit, vision, uh, the angel Uriel, angel Uriel is the one who commonly visits Ezra, he states the following I have come to show you these things tonight. If therefore you will pray again and fast again for seven days, I will again declare to you greater things than these, for your voice has surely been heard before the Most High. For the Mighty One has seen your uprightness and has observed the purity which you maintain from your youth. Therefore, he sent me to show you all these things. Later on, after uh, this, the famous speech by Ezra, which I mentioned, where he, Ezra is lamenting the fact that, that God, has, uh, God has given the Israel over to the hands of the nations, when in fact God should be giving the nations over to Israel, uh, then Uriel replies to Ezra as follows. Rise, Ezra, and listen 
to the words which I have come to speak to you. Rise, Ezra, and listen to the words which I have come to speak to you. So again, in these two examples from 4 Ezra, again, a very clear uh, pattern of I have come plus purpose clause. Just as in the synoptic I have come sayings in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Again, very closely related to 4 Ezra is a, an apocalypse called Second Baruch, the apocalypse of Baruch in Syriac. Again, the context is the destruction of Jerusalem. Again, it's a lament over why God has allowed this to happen. And you can see again in the quotation from uh, to Baruch here that, um, again, it's a purpose clause. Ramael, the angel who addresses Baruch, the angel Ramael, has just talked again about having been sent by God and then addresses Baruch as one who has come. So this is the vision which you have seen, Mr. Baruch, and this is its explanation. For I have come to tell you these things since your prayer has been heard by the Most High. Again, it's sort of very much dependent on the language that we saw in Daniel, isn't it? The sort of similar idea of uh, Baruch being a person who is highly favoured, so uh, he prays and then an angel comes and replies. Another important type of literature in the early Jewish period is the genre of the testament. Now, in this, uh, what you frequently have is an old patriarch of of Israel, like uh, Abraham or Isaac or Jacob, or most commonly Jacob's various sons, uh, who on their deathbeds pronounce great prophecies of what is going to happen in the future. So it's a way of uh, Jews in 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 the sort of roughly New Testament period talking about how God had actually mapped out the course of history all along because here, lo and behold, we can see that Isaac or Jacob has foreseen what was going to happen in these last days. One of these is the Testament of Isaac, which is where our next uh, example comes from. Um, This is generally dated to around the 2nd century AD, and uh, there's a little bit of controversy over whether this is actually a Jewish text uh, rather than a Christian text. Sometimes with a lot of these Jewish texts, they've been transmitted, they've been passed down actually by Christians, even though they were originally Jewish texts. Uh, So this is true of a lot of the uh, um, apocalyptic literature from early Judaism. The Jewish groups in which uh, they were used uh, died out, uh, and perhaps when the... the, uh, destruction of Jerusalem took place a lot of the uh, Jewish uh, copies were lost but they were preserved in in, in Christian circles so for example probably one of the most famous um, apocalypses uh, one Enoch uh, is actually still used in the canon of the Ethiopian church uh, even today uh, and so has been passed down from near the beginning to uh, the present day through, through that particular Christian group which is why we have it in Ethiopic and not any language which most of us can understand. Um, So this Testament of Isaac, which is actually also one which uh, survives in Ethiopic, uh, is probably a Jewish text. Originally, one of the ways in which you can tell whether it's a Jewish or a Christian text is whether the Christian Christian bits in it look like they've obviously been uh, added in in a sort of unsubtle editing way and whether if you take them out then the text still makes sort of good sense Uh, that's one way and this is one text the Testament of Isaac where scholars think that if you chop out the Christian bits um, the text works equally well in terms of its its argument someone once tried to persuade me that uh, I remember I went to a Dead Sea Scrolls conference and um, someone tried to explain to me that uh, all the references to Jesus in Romans had been added in later Uh, I think Romans is probably a text where uh, you could say that if you chop out the Christian bits then it doesn't still continue to make sense very well Um, (laughs) this chap was trying to persuade me that Jesus and Josephus were the same person Um, you get a lot of loonies at Dead Sea Scrolls conferences actually but um, the testament of Isaac is, is on, at the other end of the spectrum if you, the, the, the Christian bits look like they're later, later insertions so here, um, before Isaac died, as I say, these are deathbed scenes in, in these testaments. Um, before Isaac dies, he was visited by the archangel Michael. 
And Michael says to a, a fearful and trembling Isaac, Be courageous in your spirit, for I come near to you from the presence of God in order to bring you up to heaven, into the presence of your father Abraham and all the holy ones. So I come near to you. Uh, first person, I, have come, I, I come followed by a purpose clause. Michael wants to come in order to bring Isaac's soul to God. Thirteenthly, probably not a word you hear very frequently. Uh, thirteenthly, the Jeremiah Apocryphon. Again, this is a very rare uh, text, not very well known uh, to biblical scholars. It's only been translated into English for the first time in the last couple, uh, couple of decades. And again, here there's been discussion over whether it was originally a Jewish text or whether it was a Christian text. Uh, first and foremost and uh, various versions uh, survive in, uh, in in various different languages um, the most important version is in Garshuni does anyone know what Garshuni is? type of type of Arabic yeah yeah. the language Garshuni is actually Sir- the Syriac language in Arabic script yeah so there you have it um Again, it's a, if, you, if, you, if you want to write a secret apocalyptic text, when, then what better than to write it in one language but in the script of another? You know, keep it secret. Um, the work, this work, the Jeremiah Apocryphon, is centred on. Uh, it's based on. It's based on the book of Jeremiah. It's kind of rewriting of, of uh, what happens in Jeremiah, and um, it's about the exile of Israel first, but then the ultimate restoration, and. What happens is that just before the restoration, Michael comes, the archangel Michael comes to Jeremiah and tells him what's going to happen. And uh, he says, I quote, Jeremiah, chosen one of God, behold, I tell you, I have come to redeem this people and to take them to the land of their fathers. I have come to redeem this people. Next, we turn to a few examples of texts where an, a certain Old Testament passage has been modified. We, we've talked a lot about how, vari- how, how various uh, um, incidents in the Old Testament have been totally reshaped and everything. But this is specific Old Testament pat- passages which, when they're translated and interpreted, take on the significance of angels coming to say, uh, I have come in order to do su- such and such. So in Numbers 22... The next example comes from that. In Numbers 22, the angel of the Lord, uh, when he's coming to Balaam, says, I have come as an opponent to you. Now, the Hebrew is a bit ambiguous here. Uh, it may be that in the, Hebrew, in the original Hebrew, there is an I have come plus purpose. But there certainly is in the various translations, in the Targums and in the Vulgate, the Latin translation of this. So here, uh, it's clear that in the Targum, the angel of the Lord says to them, uh, says to Balaam, why did you strike your ass these three times? Behold, I have come out to oppose you. And then the, uh, the Aramaic there, because the Targums are the early uh, translations of the, of the Old Testament into Aramaic. Uh, similarly, with the Vulgate there, I have come to oppose you. In the next uh, four examples, 15 to 17 and and then 18, we have uh, the translations of the famous scene in which Joshua is confronted by the angel of the Lord, who is the captain of the armies of the Most High. Now, if you know the uh, original stories, you'll know it's a bit strange. Suddenly, out of the blue, you get this uh, reference to the angel of the Lord confronting uh, Joshua. And Joshua... um, asks this angel of the Lord whether he's on his side or not. Quite a sort of useful piece of information to know because this angel of the Lord has appeared with a sword and so Joshua wants to know whose side he's on. In the Targum, this is expanded into a longer discussion where we have statements, about, statements by the angel about what it is that he's exactly come to do. So uh, I'll give you a... Unfortunately, this hasn't been translated into English, so I've had to... Uh, using my rusty Aramaic, come up with a translation uh, of this Targum. Joshua fell before the angel of the Lord here on the ground and asked him and said to him, is it to support us 
that you have come? Or do you belong to our enemies and seek to kill? And the angel of the Lord says to him, I have not come to support and I am not an enemy. I have not come to help, in other words, and I am not an enemy. But as the angel who is sent from Yahweh, I have come to complain because of the evening in which you neglected the sacrifice and today have neglected Torah study. So why have you come? The the angel replies, well, I've come because you've neglected to study the Torah and you've neglected to, um, to do the sacrifices. And then Joshua asks, for which of these particular ones have, reasons have you come? And then the angel says again, mysteriously, I have not come to support you. I have not come to help you. And Joshua fell on his face. I suppose the interesting thing here is that uh, if you remember from the brief glance through the examples in Matthew, Mark and Luke this morning, what we get in a lot of them is Jesus saying, I have not come in order to do this, but I have come to do this. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Do not think that I've come to bring peace on the earth. I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. Uh, And similarly here, you have that same antithetical way of speaking by the angel of the Lord in this Targum. I have not come to support. I have come to complain. I've not come to help, but to complain. So this example, I think, is particularly reminiscent of those examples in the Synoptic Gospels. Number 18, from the Midrash Tanchuma to Exodus. This is a a Midrash, a rabbinic uh, kind of a commentary, but not like a commentary that we would uh, expect. Very sort of uh, expansive commentary, bringing in lots of other verses, but when, then when it brings in a parallel verse, it doesn't just sort of mention it uh, briefly. It then goes into a whole extra commentary on that parallel verse and then so on and so on. And so you can go for pages and pages and pages, a bit like some of those uh, New International Greek commentaries on one verse. Um, mentioning no names. <laughs> oh, why not? Well, Greg Beale. If you know Greg Beale's New International Greek... <laughs> Greek commentary on, uh, on, on Revelation, you, you know, uh, when, you, when you get to uh, the theme of the temple, suddenly there's an excursus for 20 pages on, you know, the, the worldwide temple and sanctuary in Isaiah. Sorry, Greg. Um, so that's, that explains why in this Midrash to Exodus, you suddenly have this big, long explanation uh, well, it is, I've only given you a tiny snippet here. You get this big, this long explanation of, why, of, of uh, Joshua 5. Um, this is a text that comes probably from around the 3rd, 4th century AD. So some of these, some of these Jewish texts that I'm mentioning are a bit uh, are sort of after the New Testament period, but uh, the, the reason I'm bringing in is, is not, because, uh, not because I'm saying that one particular text here is in the mind of Jesus and the authors of the Synoptic Gospels when, when they use the I've come sayings, but it's, it's a whole sort of sweep of Jewish tradition in which this is a thing commonly said by angels. So in this particular example, the Midrash Tanhuma, um, he's talking about the angel of the Lord and what the angel of the Lord does in Exodus, but then goes on to what the angel of the Lord does with Joshua. This is the kind of second coming of of the angel of the Lord, if you like, uh, in in rabbinic tradition. Joshua saw the angel, this is quoting the text, Joshua saw the angel and fell down before him. What did he say to him? In Joshua 5.13, are you for us and for our adversaries? This is again this, this, this same discussion that we've just looked at. When he, Joshua, said to him, the angel, are you for us? The angel began to cry in great anguish. No, but I am the captain of the Lord's hosts. Now I have come. Here are two times that I have come to give Israel an inheritance. I am the one who came in the days of your master Moses, but he rejected me. Uh, The the angel of the Lord is said to have come to uh, Moses to bring about the uh, exodus, but uh, Moses turned him down, but now Joshua has, been, uh, has given the angel a bit more of a warm reception. Number 19, 
Again, uh, as with the example of the devil coming to visit uh, the serpent in the testament of uh, the apocalypse of Moses, here we have again the devil coming to, uh, or the angel of death coming to Moses. Um, apparently it was quite hard to get Moses to die. God, uh, in, in rabbinic tradition anyway, uh, God first of all sent the archangel Michael to go and uh, bring uh, Moses' soul, uh, but uh, Michael refused because apparently uh, Michael had been Moses' teacher. So God sends the angel of death, the angel who gets the name Samael in rabbinic tradition. And the angel, uh, M- Moses, uh, Moses is quite a sort of brave guy, so he, you know, he, sa- he says to the angel of death, what are you doing here? I'm not going to follow you. Uh, but uh, the angel says, I have come to bear away your breath. Litol nishmathecha. So, again, an angelic figure saying, I, am, I have come in order to do such and such. Finally, the latest example. Uh, that uh, last reference from the Midrash was probably, again, a quite a late one from 5th, 6th century AD. And this last one is very late from the 10th century. Again, I'm trying to give a sort of impression of a long sweep, a long tradition of angels doing this that goes right back to uh, Daniel uh, and then on to the text from around the time of Jesus and then on much later again. Just retrieve my watch. So this comes from the vision of Daniel, which can be dated fairly securely to the 10th century AD because it has uh, references to certain Christian emperors. And the text is... Uh, preserved in a Hebrew manuscript, written in Hebrew, uh, and was found in, uh, in Cairo. And it goes, uh, the key bit for our purposes goes as follows, in the quote on the handout. I, Daniel, stood by the river Hebar, and the dread vision was heavy upon me, and I was amazed. And there came to me Gabriel, captain of the heavenly host, and he said to me, No, beloved man, and hearken, I have come to tell you, that the mighty Holy One commanded me, go, Gabriel, and reveal to Daniel what is to be at the end of days. Again, the, the common theme of, uh, of angelic visits to Daniel, that they come to reveal something to him. In all these texts, we get a big variety of purposes in what these angels come to do. Uh, remember, Michael has come to redeem the people of Israel in uh, the Apocryphon of Jeremiah, uh, in the previous text about uh, the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord comes to give Israel an inheritance. Uh, Again, though, in these texts which are are more dependent on Daniel, there's a strong emphasis on the revelation that the angel has come to accomplish. But uh, what they all have in common is that they have this formula, I have come in order to do such and such. So, um, if you're not completely worn out by these, uh, all these 20 examples, uh, then you can actually look at uh, the, the extra ones which I also discuss in the book that I'm working on at the moment. Um, but perhaps you've had more than enough already. As I say, the main purpose of giving you, bombarding you with all these examples is to try and show that these are not only the closest parallels to the I have come sayings of Jesus, but they're also by far the most abundant parallels. They're the closest because unlike the Josephus example that I mentioned, the Josephus example, remember, wasn't like the I have come sayings of Jesus because Josephus, when he said I have come to you, Vespasian, was just talking about an individual incident of his life. Whereas these angels, when they talk about their comings to earth, are summing up their whole earthly mission by using this I have come plus purpose formula. In that respect, they're the closest parallels to the sayings of Jesus but also they're by far the most abundant. I've given you 20 here, there are more, um, and, uh, but scholars often just struggle to provide this one Josephus example when they try to argue that, they, that Jesus is only a prophet here. Again, the I have come plus purpose formula is not a, a way of speaking that was used by ordinary people or even by prophetic figures. It's not uh, something that's used... Uh, said by normal people to sum up their life's destiny. So I argue again that there's, I would argue again that there's good grounds for reading these I have come sayings of Jesus in a more literal way as referring to a coming from A to B. Not in an idiomatic sense, but Jesus saying I have come from somewhere. 
in order to cast fire on the earth or, or whatever. The, impl- the place of origin implied as heaven. I'm not arguing that Jesus is here depicted as merely an angel, although certainly there is a lot, of in- lot in common uh, in the way Jesus speaks with the way in which the angel of the Lord speaks, and uh, we could talk about that uh, sometime as well. But in conclusion, uh, the key point is that this, the comings of Jesus, which I'm going to talk about more in the lunch lecture tomorrow, these comings of, uh, the coming of Jesus is specifically identified as a coming with a purpose, implying uh, Jesus not originally doing the things that he was going to do, but resolving to take on flesh and to do them in the earthly sphere. And it's this element of Jesus' own prior intent before his action, his prior intent to carry out this action, that hasn't been sufficiently recognised by scholars, I would argue, hasn't been sufficiently recognised in previous analyses of the I Have Come sayings. And as a result, the implication of his pre-existence prior to his coming has also been missed. And we'll see in the following lecture, I I realise that this has been a a journey into uh, uncharted lands for many of you, into all these obscure texts, but I promise you that in the next lecture we'll be back on more familiar territory of the Gospels, so uh, please do come back for the next one. We'll see in the lecture tomorrow that the argument for pre-existence of Christ in the I Have Come sayings is actually reinforced when we look at these sayings themselves. Thanks very much. Uh, just to remind you or to uh, supplement what you might have heard if you've missed some of the other lectures, the story so far, and uh, I'm, going, I'm following fairly closely the handout here, uh, other human figures in early Judaism and more broadly do not sum up their lives' work by saying, I have come in order to do such and such. Rather, the I have come sayings of Jesus, the sayings such as, I have come to cast fire on the earth, do not think I've come to uh, abolish the law and the prophets, I've not come to abolish them but to fulfill them. Statements like that are most closely and most abundantly paralleled by the announcements by angels, where angels say, I have come to reveal the truth to you, and and things like that. Uh, The examples of the parallels that I gave in the lecture yesterday. And Thirdly, this can be explained by the fact that Jesus, I have come sayings, also refer to, like the angels, also refer to a coming from heaven with a purpose for the whole of his earthly ministry. So clearly, both in in the early Jewish texts that I mentioned yesterday, angels come from heaven, announce the reason for their coming, I have come in order to do such and such, uh, because they have a pre-existence in heaven. Similarly, in the statements attributed to Jesus in Matthew, Mark and Luke, he says, I have come from heaven for this very purpose because he comes from a similar pre-existence in heaven. So, so far in the first two lectures, I've focused on the the sort of form of the statement, the, the language of I have come to and what its significance is. In this lecture, I want to focus more on the content of the sayings and on the purposes that Jesus explains in these sayings in Matthew, Mark and Luke. And the content is really focused on three elements, which I think all contribute to the sense of Jesus coming from heaven and to his pre-existence. Just to summarise briefly, I'll go into this in more detail as I look at the actual uh, texts themselves. First of all, the picture is of Jesus coming as one who stands over against the whole of humanity. He comes to cast fire, to bring division among people, for example. Secondly, there's the cosmic scope it's not, uh, of Jesus' coming. It's not just a coming that places him over against all of humanity, but over against the whole earth. Uh, when he says things like, I have come to cast fire on the earth. I do not think I've come to bring peace on the earth, and so on. And finally, a number of the sayings, or some of the sayings at least, emphasize the kind of dynamic motion involved in this coming. So, for example, when he says, I have come... Uh, to the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost, the picture of him going to look for, look for his sheep. So uh, I'm going to look briefly at these ten sayings. Uh, as I said before, the first two are actually not I have come, but had you come, demons addressing Jesus, then the I have come sayings proper, and then finally the Son of Man has come to in the last two sayings. 
So first of all, in Mark 1.24, the demon said, What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So the setting of this is in the very first of Jesus' exorcisms in Mark's Gospel. He's in a synagogue in Capernaum, and his exorcism meets with astonishment by the crowd. One of the members of the crowd, though, is possessed by a demon who then utters these words, Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. So the question is, uh, first of all, what does the demon mean when he says, Have you come to destroy us? Is he referring to himself as the demon and the rest of the congregation in Capernaum? Or is he referring to us as us demons collectively? This is an important question because it, it, uh, it raises the, the question of whether the references to Jesus coming specifically to Capernaum, to this synagogue, to destroy everyone in attendance at this congregation, or is it a reference to Jesus coming to the whole human sphere, to the whole sphere of the world in in possession and in under the control of these evil forces. I would argue that this is the latter. This is a cosmic coming of Jesus to destroy the whole of the demonic realm. First of all, it's not clear why uh, anyone would think that Jesus uh, has come to destroy the whole congregation in attendance in this synagogue, the people as well. Uh, secondly, the congregation themselves see that the threat is very much to the demons and not to themselves. They're rather pleased that this is going on, astonished, but uh, there's no sense that they see Jesus coming as a threat to themselves. And finally, in the other example in Matthew, the threat is very clearly to demons and demons alone, uh, in a reference that we'll move on to now. Uh, in, Matthew, in the second one, Matthew 8, 29, Behold, they, these are the, the demons, screamed, saying, What have we to do with you, son of God? Have you come here to destroy us before our due time? Mark's demons ask their question in a synagogue in Capernaum. In Matthew 8, it's a scene in the region of the Gadarenes, the famous scene with all the pigs jumping off the cliff. Uh, and again, I think in both these sayings, that reference is to Jesus coming into the world under the control, under the grip of demonic forces. So again, it's Jesus standing over against the whole world uh, and not just a coming to Capernaum. Next, for the next six sayings, then, we get on to the I have come sayings proper, the, one, the places where Jesus actually says, I have come. And the number three is Mark 1:38, And he said to them, let us go elsewhere into the nearby villages so that I may also preach there, because it is for this reason that I have come forth. Now again, as with that first example of Jesus coming to the synagogue in Capernaum, scholars debate over whether Jesus is talking here about a coming from one part of, uh, of Galilee to another, or whether this is some kind of cosmic coming into the world. Um, so, for example, some scholars say that this is uh, a coming out of the house. Jesus has just been performing lots of healings in the house of uh, Simon Peter's um, mother-in-law isn't it uh, and uh, so then immediately afterwards it talks about how he goes off into a deserted place to pray so some scholars say when Jesus says I have come forth here it means he's come out of the house the problem with this though is that uh, there, it, when it talks about him coming out of the house it says he's come out specifically to pray not to preach in 138 here the reference is specifically to Jesus saying I have come forth in order to preach. Uh, another scholar, another commentator on Mark, uh, Morna Hooker, argues that uh, here Jesus is talking about his coming forth from his homeland in Nazareth. He's come forth out of this, uh, his, his homeland, out of obscurity, into the wider region of Galilee in order to conduct his preaching ministry in the various villages. So it's really a question of whether you go with that or whether, again, you go with this cosmic coming, Jesus talking about coming forth from God. So which is it, coming forth from Nazareth or coming forth from God? Well, I think this question is answered by looking at the parallel in Luke chapter 4. Luke records the exact same scene, but he paraphrases it slightly, paraphrases Jesus' words very slightly in this last element when he says, it, uh, when Jesus says in Luke 4, it's necessary for me to preach the kingdom of God in the other towns also, because for this reason, 
exactly the same so far, because for this reason, I have been sent. Here, a clearly theological tone. So if Luke has got Mark right here, as I think he probably has, uh, then the reference to coming and to sending are synonymous. As I said, as I've said in some of the previous lectures, sending and coming are very similar ideas. They're not absolutely identical. The first one refers to the father's action of sending from heaven and the second refers to the son's action of coming into the human sphere. So they're sort of the two ends of the, of the event, if you like. So, uh, and a number of other commentators make reference to the fact that Luke has correctly understood what Mark was talking about. Uh, if that's right, then this reference to coming forth is, is very interesting because it's, it, it's perhaps an even stronger reference to uh, some kind of coming from heaven than the simple verb to come. There are two, two different, two, two, well, two slightly different verbs, ex erkomai, to come forth, and erkomai, to, to come. Jesus usually uses the, the sort of simple verb to come, but here he makes reference to coming forth, to coming out, uh, coming out of the heavenly council. So, a very strong probability of coming forth from heaven here. Fourthly, in Mark chapter 2, paralleled in the other synoptic gospels, Jesus heard this and said to them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So, following immediately after the healing and forgiveness of the paralytic in the, at the beginning of Mark chapter 2 is the event where Jesus calls Levi and Levi immediately throws the dinner party and introduces Jesus to his friends. Um, probably all heard sermons on how this is a good, a good example of evangelism. In terms of the evidence of pre-existence, uh, the, the commentators, I think, again, there's been... Uh, uh, sorry, let me backtrack. When we come to this text, there's no debate over whether the reference could be to a cosmic coming or whether it's to a local coming, whether it's to a coming from one part of Galilee to another. As we move on to the other texts, we'll suddenly see that this possibility of it just referring to Jesus moving around from one part of Galilee to another becomes an impossibility, and it becomes un indisputable that Jesus is referring to the whole of his ministry and to, the refer to a reference to his, his coming and summing uh, as a way of talking about his whole earthly existence. So uh, here he's talking about the purpose of his whole earthly ministry as coming to call the righteous. There's a possible additional reference, to, uh, a possible addition, additional sort of hint of a heavenly origin here if we uh, see that Jesus is talking about this calling here as a calling to the heavenly banquet. Remember one of the images that you see over and over again in the Gospels is of Jesus inviting people to the Father's messianic, to, well, to the Father's banquet, which is also the messianic banquet, the feast of the kingdom of God. Uh, and because Jesus is talking at a dinner here, uh, we might think that perhaps this uh, is a, a, an additional hint of talking, calling, in other words, the summons to the heavenly banquet. But that's only a possibility. Um, in the fifth text, Matthew 5:17 very famous, do not think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets, do not, I have not come to abolish them but to fulfill them. Uh, this is obviously a text that's attracted a great deal of scholarly interest because it's concerned with the question, uh, it's, it has immediate bearing on to what extent Christians are under the law, to what extent Jesus talked about relativizing and uh, downplaying the law as important for Christian obedience, to what extent he still thinks it's uh, an important uh, boundary stone for uh, the Christian life. But we're not focusing on, on that issue here, thank goodness. We're just, just talking about uh, the reason for Jesus coming uh, as indicating his coming from heaven. And it's the first I have come saying in Matthew's Gospel. Here, he's focusing on, um, Matthew's focusing on the coming of Jesus in order to fulfill the law and the prophets. As a, again, then the in intent of Jesus is coming to uh, submit to the plan of God in the Old Testament. Again, a clear indication of Jesus summarizing his whole earthly activity and not simply talking about a coming to a particular village. Uh, number six, and uh, the next two or three are, I think, particularly important for my argument and as evidence for pre-existence. Luke 12:49, I've come to cast fire onto the earth. 
and how I wish it were already kindled. So I think more explicit uh, evidence still for uh, pre-existence. The fire is the fire of judgment, um, but the key point is that the fire comes from heaven. Fire, the fire of judgment in the Old Testament always comes uh, from heaven, from God himself. So some scholars, when they talk about uh, fire, immediately think of Elijah here. After all, Elijah was with the 450 prophets of Baal, remember, and prayed for fire to come down from the earth. So some scholars think of Jesus being portrayed in terms of Elijah here. But as I said said in the lecture yesterday, remember, it's vitally important that we not just sort of grab the nearest Old Testament text that comes to hand, which happens to have the same word in both passages, uh, but uh, rather to really look closely at the, 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 the way in which the New Testament authors use particular traditions from the Old Testament. So remember, the, the, difference, the key difference here between what Jesus is doing and what Elijah's, Elijah did was that Elijah prayed for the fire to come from heaven, prayed that God would send the fire, whereas Jesus here is claiming that he has actually sent the fire. He is the one who has cast fire on the earth. So a claim here, I think, to divine rather than to a prophetic, a kind of Elijah-style identity. The closest Old Testament parallel, I think, comes from Genesis 19, where with the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, the Lord rained fire and brimstone uh, out of heaven from the Lord onto Sodom and Gomorrah. So I think if Jesus' intention in coming is that purpose of coming to bring fire, I think that's more clearly really than anywhere else uh, in the Synoptic Gospels and a piece of evidence for his coming as a coming from heaven to earth implies bringing to the world something from outside it. Uh, so the question sort of came to me, would it, would it make sense for someone to cast fire onto the earth if, if they were just sort of from the earth in the first place? It's a sort of really, uh, it's a really huge scale of operation that Jesus is referring to here, one in which he stands over against the whole earth. So I don't think it makes good sense to talk about this coming here as merely a sort of coming out of obscurity or a coming onto the scene. Really, the evidence points to a coming from heaven and from a pre-existence there. For the same reasons, I think verse 51, the next text, uh, indicates the same kind of pre-existence. Again, Jesus is talking about judgment. This whole uh, these three verses in succession, I haven't mentioned uh, Luke 12:50, but you get, I've come to cast fire onto the earth, how I wish it were already kindled. Uh, and then in verse 50, Jesus talks about the baptism which he has to undergo, uh, the fact that he himself is going to bear this judgment that he's come to bring. And then in verse 51 in the next verse, do not think that I've come to bring peace on the earth. I tell you, I've not come to bring peace, but division. Or in Matthew's uh, uh, version of the saying, Jesus come to bring a sword, kind of synonymous concepts to do with judgment. So again, judgment is the main thing. And here there's a kind of radically different uh, picture of Jesus from, uh, fr- from what we get even elsewhere in the Gospels about Jesus being the Prince of Peace. There's a, ten- a sort of tension in Jesus' ministry that on one hand he's come to bring peace, but the way in which he's going to accomplish this is through a radical <laughs> separation of people and a radical event which is going to cause a huge rift in humanity. So Jesus comes into the world both to bring peace, but also thereby to bring disharmony. And the implication is that this is again the same purpose that he has in coming from heaven to earth there. Um, I just mentioned this briefly. Uh, In Matthew's version, where where Matthew talks about the sword... I think we have to reckon with the possibility that Matthew may be thinking of Jesus as an incarnate, as, an incarnate, uh, as the, the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament incarnate. Someone asked me about this the other day, and I think maybe this saying, which talks about Jesus having come to bring a sword, is maybe the sort of tip of the iceberg in uh, New Testament theology that perhaps enables us to see Jesus as the incarnation of the Malach Alonai in uh, the Old Testament. Um, the reason I mention that is because two of the sayings that I mentioned yesterday, two of the passages from the Old Testament, talk about the angel of the Lord coming along and saying, uh, coming along with a sword and saying, "I have come in order to do such and such." So I think I've, I think these are on the uh, 
handout as well. Are they not? Oh, I've just given you the references in Numbers 22, Joshua 5, and 1 Chronicles uh, 21. I'll just uh, read them brief- briefly. Then the Lord opened the eyes of... This is familiar from this morning. The, the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his drawn sword in his hand. And the angel of the Lord said to him, I have come forth as an adversary to you. And so on. That's the numbers reference. In the Joshua reference, uh, Joshua looked up and saw a man standing before him with a drawn sword in his hand. He says, as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And there's a reference again in 1 Chronicles to the angel of the Lord who uh, stands between heaven and earth uh, and pronounces over Jerusalem that... uh, Uh, and sort of wields his sword over Jerusalem. Interesting that the angel of the Lord stands between heaven and earth in that one Chronicles passage. So it's possible that Jesus coming with a sword uh, might bring resonances of that angel of the Lord theme in the Old Testament. In any case, whatever you think of that, uh, I think that Matthew 10, 34, these two sayings, uh, I've come to cast fire, I've come to bring peace, uh, really clearly point to Jesus coming from pre-existence in heaven. The Matthew saying is followed by another I have come in Matthew 10.35, moving on to number 8. For I've come to divide man against father and daughter against mother and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. So in Matthew, the emphasis, you know, he really sort of stacks up these I have come sayings to make the point very clearly. Uh, And here again, I think the logical approach would be to say that I have come obviously means the same thing here as it did in the previous verse. Um, Again, Jesus continues to stand over the whole population of the world. He stands over against the whole of humanity. He comes from the outside to divide one against another. So just to summarize these last three, numbers six, seven, and eight, which I think are the key texts for highlighting Jesus coming from outside. They point in particular to the cosmic scope of Jesus coming, that he stands over against the whole world on the one hand and then stands over against the whole of humanity, the whole of humanity that populates that world. And I think this goes beyond the curriculum vitae of any prophet, uh, either in Israel's history who's lived already uh, or any prophet that was expected to uh, come in the future. There is a slight exception to that, uh, which is, which is uh, significant, but not a real exception. Um, the, it's, it's actually similar, I might as well mention it, it's actually similar to what uh, the rabbis expected that Elijah would do when he would return. Um, but then, of course, when Elijah returns, he himself is coming from heaven uh, because he's with God in the present. Finally, the two Son of Man sayings, that uh, give a similar picture here. Mark 10.45, again, like, Ma- like uh, Matthew 5.17, a very hotly disputed passage because it has all, sort of, all, all sorts of important implications for the atonement uh, and so on. But uh, again, we're not going to talk about them here. Matthew, Mark 10.45, paralleled in Matthew 20.28, 20, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Again, it's very clear that this isn't a local coming from one bit of Galilee into another village or town in Galilee. Uh, And again, it's not the prophetic identity. Jesus isn't being cast as a prophetic figure here. For for one thing, the Son of Man figure in Daniel is certainly not a a prophetic figure. And so uh, Jesus, when he makes this statement, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, Uh, It wouldn't make sense if people expected the Son of Man to be a merely prophetic figure. No, people expected that the Son of Man would be the person to whom all tongue, tribe and nation would submit uh, and to whom all authority on heaven and earth was given uh, in Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Sort of rough paraphrase. And so that's why Jesus says that in this, his first coming, he comes not to be served, to be worshipped, as he will be in the end, but he comes initially to serve people. So essentially, this is uh, very similar to an I have come saying. Jesus is obviously talking about himself when he refers to the Son of Man. And again, the emphasis is on Jesus' voluntary coming. He came for this specific purpose, with this specific intention, to give his life for many. 
Finally, Luke chapter 19, verse 10, the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. I think the distinctive contribution that this text makes, as I hinted in the introduction at the beginning, is that this portrays the Son of Man as a figure who goes out looking for his lost sheep. Uh, It's mainly dependent on Ezekiel chapter 34, where God is depicted as the one who goes out, like the shepherd, to bring back uh, those who have wandered off and bringing them back to the flock. So, again, this uh, idea of the dynamic movement involved in the shepherd, you, we have it in other, parale- uh, in other parables in the Gospels, don't we, about the, 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 the shepherd who looks like, a, like an idiotic shepherd because he leaves his 99 sheep behind just to go out and get this one. Uh, the, the image of, the, of, of, of movement there, clearly defined. And again, I think in this, Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. There's this clear idea of movement from the heavenly sphere to the earthly sphere to bring back the lost sheep. So, just to wrap things up in conclusion, I think there's good reason to uh, see evidence of pre-existence in these ten I have come sayings that I've mentioned. I talked in the last two lectures specifically about the, the the grammatical form and what you might expect I have come in order to do literally to mean it. It does sort of on the surface of things appear to refer to a coming from A to B. Uh, And similarly, this is reinforced, I think, in the examples I gave yesterday in which lots and lots of angels all across Jewish literature say, I have come. They don't say from heaven, but they imply from heaven in order to do such and such an earthly ministry, whether it's on a a small and snappy short scale delivering a message to Daniel or whether it's on on the big macro scale of redeeming Israel which is uh, the way what Michael does in the Archangel Michael does in one of the rabbinic texts and in what uh, um, the Archangel, uh, the Angel of the Lord does in another rabbinic text. In these ten I have come sayings that we've looked at today then, the focus has been in my trying to bolster this argument further by pointing to the way in which uh, Jesus standing over against the whole of humanity and the whole of the world points to very likely are coming from heaven again and the dynamic movement involved in going out and looking to the sheep. So, we have evidence of of pre-existence undergirding Jesus' statements here that he came with a prior intent and that that voluntary action of coming from heaven to earth was uh, was for the purpose of a few closely related uh, intentions and purposes. Now, if this is right, then pre-existence really is widespread in the New Testament. It's not only confined to those first few verses of John's Gospel, elsewhere in John as well, of course, uh, and in Paul. uh, It's also in Hebrews. But uh, I think the the, the sort of controversial argument from a scholarly point of view is that uh, this uh, is also present in the Synoptic Gospels. So when one looks at the theology of the New Testament as a whole, pre-existence can be seen to be very prominent not merely a sort of optional extra, not merely a marginal aspect that was uh, the result of a speculation by a few authors. Similarly, it's very important for dogmatic theology. Uh, In the New Testament, it often functions to highlight the grace of Christ in coming, that he came and loved us and gave himself for us. So it highlights, in particular, the grace of the Son, the Lord Jesus, who left the glory of the Father, who was rich, but who made himself poor for our sakes. Amen. Shall we just pray as we finish? Father God, we pray that we would remember this uh, grace, the grace of your sending your Son and the grace of the Son in coming. Father, we pray that we would uh, imitate this love of Jesus that he had for us in forsaking your uh, fellowship in heaven and being forsaken for us on the cross to buy our atonement. Father, we pray that we wouldn't uh, seek our own glory, but would be willing to give everything up for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.